We're live. Um, friends, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, my name is Ranjit Anipu, co-founder of Be Waste Wise. Be Waste Wise is your knowledge partner for the results revolution. Um, welcome to Pioneers and Changemakers. This new initiative is a weekly series of 30-minute interviews with some of the best minds in circular economy, sanitation, wastes, and resource management. There are a lot of problems in our world, um, you know that, but not enough leaders. Um, so in this program, in addition to um, learning about what people are doing worldwide, you'll also learn how they implement solutions and how they choose um, or chose between alternatives and why they began their journeys. Uh, this program builds on our annual program called the Global Dialogue on Waste and our knowledge partnerships with the Asian Development Bank, the International Solid Waste Association, and Waste Aid UK. Uh, this program is uh, not just about listening to leaders, but it is about learning to be a leader and uh, becoming one. So it is for the pioneers and change makers in you. Today, uh, we have uh, Claire Mifflin, uh, who is an architect and uh, uh, who is also interested in waste management. Now, there aren't uh, too many of them. And uh, she's also exploring uh, how biomimicry could be used for zero waste. And that makes the number of people doing that even lesser. Now, uh, she's changing the way New York City, the city of skyscrapers, handles waste and changing the role of uh, buildings in zero waste. Um, I I've been a long time resident of um, New York, uh, so uh, this is very personal to me. So um, Claire, welcome to Be Waste Wise Pioneers and Changemakers. Could you tell us a little bit about your work? Sure, thank you. Um, I am an architect and my architectural background was in very sustainable architecture, but mainly looking at energy and water and resource reduction. Um, my, my career change into waste really came after a talk in 2015 where um, we, I moderated a panel that was looking at organic waste and the city's new organics collection. And I was asking, well, what should I do? In an, I just finished a residential building with 80 units and we had three shoots for the recycling and trash. What should I do? How can this building collect organics in, a, in, a, in an efficient way or what should I provide in a new building? And there were no real solutions. Nobody has ever done an organics shoot. So New York City trash is in residential buildings is normally collected in shoots. Um, so there were no organics shoots. There are recycling shoots. And just knowing that there was no good solution started this three year long process of developing the zero waste design guidelines. Um, mm. And that it really would to show architects and designers how we could better design buildings to reduce and separate our waste and recycle it. Right, great. Um, uh, I think zero waste design guidelines are an excellent work. I've been to one of the uh, workshops, um, not the workshops, but the final results um, dissemination. And um, it is probably the only one of its kind which focuses on building design to achieve zero waste, right? And uh, so, friends, uh, the Zero Waste Design Guidelines uh, website um, also has a zero waste calculator, and it is, uh, it is very useful if you're a building manager. Um, I used it and I found it was fun, even if you're not a building manager. Uh, so, um, Claire, uh, could you talk about the, the design guidelines? I know it's a very, uh, you started with a very diverse stakeholder engagement for this. Yeah. Could you talk about um, that part? Yeah, definitely. So we, we got funding through the Rockefeller Foundation to develop these zero waste design guidelines. And the way we started it was going out and visiting a load of buildings and with the super to find from where the waste was put out to where it was collected, what the issues were. And so we then brought in some of those supers along with people from city agencies, developers, architects, all to the Center for Architecture um, to, to look at what the issues are and how they could be better. So each workshop focused on a different issue. So the residential building workshop would bring in residential developers and architects and supers and we would present, this is what we found when we went out and looked at all these buildings. Here are some solutions we think could work. But then we split into groups and brainstorm them and listen to everybody's expertise. We'd split into small groups so we got a lot of feedback. And then we would develop the guidelines and then we showed those again in the final workshop. 
But right. we did four different workshops along the way, and the amount of people coming to the workshops in total was almost 100 people. Mm -hmm. One of the few workshops. Yeah, so it was very, uh, it was a very iterative process, um, and and um, I was definitely surprised by the diversity. Um, maybe because I wasn't thinking that was possible in waste management. Um, and I know you mentioned that uh, many others um, said the same thing about, you know, the diversity. Yeah, people so, love that. Yeah, was that always the plan um, to keep it, was it a priority from the beginning or uh, did it happen after you started? I would uh, love to say there was a grand plan, <laughs> <laughs> but it was really a process that we thought, oh, who should we invite to the advisory committee and had certain people and then word of mouth would get to extra people who wanted to be involved. And I didn't say no to anybody. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it was just a process of if someone wants to be involved and wants to give up their time to help us workshop solutions, we'll have them come. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, wonderful. Um, and um, what's your inspiration for doing all of this? I mean, you've also started uh, looking at biomimicry. So uh, we discussed about this. Um, so c could you talk about that? Uh, it's not, not just about um, your inspiration for looking at biomimicry, but also for your inspiration for starting this uh, entire process of designing the guidelines. Yeah, I mean, it just became more and more fascinating the more I read about waste. And it came to me that although architects don't typically think of it beyond the building materials, they can do a lot. The waste, waste is a design flaw from the product design to the system design to the building design. If we put in some better design thinking, we could reduce our material usage greatly and then separate stuff so it can be reused or recycled. Um, or, I mean, all the circular economy principles and sharing economy principles too. So doing this development of the guidelines at the same time as my biomimicry professional certification and degree was really helpful because we were looking at how ecosystems work and how they change from a kind of linear resource flow in a pioneer ecosystem to circular resources flows in developed ecosystems. And that was really helpful to think of the waste at the system level. Mm -hmm. But uh, what what was your personal inspiration? Uh, what keeps you going? Was it the um, teamwork? Was it the collective action? I love the teamwork. Like a diverse team working to a, for a common goal, goal is exciting to me. And there was really great energy in the room in these sessions. Mm -hmm. People were passionate about waste and coming to it from all different angles and really happy to meet other people that they could further things with. Even mm -hmm. people from different sanitations. Um, I mean, different city agencies, like someone from sanitation meeting, someone from DOT, the Department of Transport, meeting someone from city planning who were all engaged around the waste issue. They were really happy to have people cross agency they could connect to. Um, mm -hmm. So making those connections and working to, I mean, New York City is so dense and the trash problems are so obvious on the sidewalk. It's a question of a better quality of life, a better space. And I don't know. Part of my motivation is aesthetic and just a better design. Garbage is ugly and horrible and mm. then it's all mixed up. But compost mm. and growing more food, that's great. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. So uh, it was more of a, um, uh, there is a problem, let's solve it. Or was it more like uh, this is something which can be done much better in a much more inspired way. Um, I would say it's both of those, but maybe the latter a little bit more. Okay. And it's also an empty field, as you said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. like, there's so many architects working to make things better in the energy. Um, mm -hmm. I feel there's a lot of work being done there, but the field of waste is just wide open. Nobody's working on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, when I uh, entered um, the waste management sector in 2009, um, you know, I was a student wanting to, I never thought I would be in this, but then once I started, I just felt like um, Christopher Columbus, you know, even if you <laughs> find the wrong island, you still like, you know, um, done something. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I found the same. The more you look into it, there's so much opportunity to improve things. Right. And, um, and uh, talking about the waste, the way waste is collected in New York, um, for those who are not 
aware of this. Um, if, if you look at uh, New York streets on certain dates or certain times of the day, um, you'll see that um, uh, cars are parked on, um, on the edge of the street, curbside parking, and then right uh, between the cars and the buildings, you, you'll see a lot of trash uh, um, being deposited you know, for collection. And sometimes uh, the trash from these buildings looks bigger than the cars, like from each building, it's just so huge. And it stays like that for a while uh, before it, it, it is collected. So it is a definite public health and quality of life problem too. Um, yes, it's rat issue and it, yeah, it's taking up half of our sidewalk space and we have very little. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, uh, how, how did you, um, how, so why did you choose um, New York? Um, was it because you were already here or yeah. were there any other reasons? I mean, I've been in um, New York City for over 20 years as an architect and um, just seeing the issues. Um, and so New York, because I'm here and that's where my connections are, but also I do feel that if, if New York City can solve their waste problem, it is a great um, inspiration to the rest of the world and other dense cities. And New York City has got the, in its one NYC plan, um, it has a zero waste goal. So it set this amazing goal. And I felt that it wasn't that big a deal to say, okay, how can architects help New York City get to its goal? Mm -hmm. It wasn't um, like I was having to invent the goal that was already there. It was just having me support it. Right, right, great. And um, could, could you also talk about the zero waste calculator? How was that developed? Um, that really came out of the workshops with architects saying, well, if I'm planning a new building, how can I figure out how much waste there will be? Because there's some minimal requirements in the building code to provide storage, but everything we heard from supers and um, building porters was we don't have enough space. We're moving waste around our building the whole time. We don't have enough space if there's snow and the waste isn't picked up. Mm. So that was really developed as a tool. So architects can, when they're planning a building, have an idea how much waste they need to provide for. Mm -hmm. And it can also then help if the city wants to make change to its zoning regulations to say, look, this is how much you should ask a building or developer to provide in terms of space for storage. Mm -hmm. If you're a building manager, what are the options that you have? Um, well, you can also look as a building manager because the, the calculator shows volume reduction equipment. So if you have cardboard and you bag it, as many people do, it takes up a huge amount of space. Whereas if you have a baler, it reduces it greatly. So they could look at it. The calculator does give you recommendations for volume reduction equipment like balers or compactors or organics pre treatment. So mm -hmm. people and businesses that generate a lot of organic waste, now the city has rules that they have to separate it, but you can reduce the volume and weight of it up to 90% by starting the composting process or dehydrating it. There's various options that can greatly reduce the amount of waste and make it less smelly. Um, so it gives you those recommendations too. Mm -hmm. And then it shows, well, what if you do stuff upstream? What if I reduce the amount of waste I create to start with by not having disposable plates, for example? Mm -hmm. How could I really reduce the amount of space I'd need to allocate? Right. So it is a very comprehensive um, recommendation tool. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's anything like it. Um, and we just actually, we just got a grant to Im improve it a little bit. We're even looking at whether we can include greenhouse gas emissions on it. Because mm. um, the way that waste greenhouse gas emissions are calculated is often just a small slither of the actual greenhouse gas emissions, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. But being able to put, okay, this is what I can do with energy, this is what I can do with waste, could be great. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. Um, and um, so, so um, how does um, all of this play into, um, what's the end point for the zero waste design guidelines? So, um, what do you envision for it? 
Um, I mean, I would love to see it help solve New York City's problem first and then go to other cities. Um, we always use the active design guidelines as a kind of similar framework to look at. And that, if people don't know, that's looking at how you can use design of the built environment to solve problems like diabetes and obesity through integrating activity into the built environment. Mm -hmm. So it's all those stair prompts you see and making stairs more, uh, egress stairs inviting so you'll use them rather than the elevator. It goes from that to not having a food desert so you can get fresh vegetables, um, looking at how our public space can make us more active. Mm -hmm. And that started in New York City and now public buildings follow it and in private ones, but it's also gone um, national and even worldwide people following it. Mm -hmm. And it also pushes a lot of research-based mm -hmm. um, design guidelines. There's not a lot of research on waste, there's a lot more research on health. Mm -hmm. But I think research as to what, which ways of designing, how much difference feedback makes, how much difference having all your waste streams in the same point makes, just that kind of behavior research could be really helpful. So I hope that the guidelines will lead to more research happening and then um, more implementation of them. And then within the city, once they've proved they've made a difference, they, we could do the same process in other cities or help other people do the same process in other cities. Right, great. Uh, but uh, how do you uh, envision it will be institutionalized? Um, would it be something that the city would, you know, would it still put it out as, as guidelines or would it be much more, you know, uh, enforceable? Um, um. I mean, I see that the and the Department of Sanitation have said this, it, it's great to have these guidelines because they can help inform policy. So one okay. policy could be just requiring enough space in buildings to help mm. better manage and separate waste. Mm -hmm. So the guidelines themselves won't become enforced in any way, but they'll help drive policy change. Mm. And then you can also have policies that say the architects should follow them. Mm -hmm. And that's what has happened with active design guidelines. For most our requests for proposals for housing, you have to follow them. It's mm -hmm. designers are asked to, to look at them and follow them and for public buildings too. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking okay. to city agencies like the Department of Design and Construction as to whether they could make it part of their consultant package that designers have to follow these zero waste design guidelines. Maybe you have to do a calculation based on the waste calculator. And we're also looking nationally, we're talking with the USGBC to see if LEED could include um, more on waste for new buildings. Uh, um, uh, you, that you mentioned that, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, because it probably has like two or three points uh, or metrics which um, talk about um, waste in, in actual LEED. Um, yeah, it's process. mostly construction, waste demolition, and then there's a prerequisite that says you have to have recycling. It doesn't mention organics, and it doesn't mention that you have to have a calculation. Mm -hmm. um, but then TRUE is now the TRUE standard, which was from the U.S. Zero Waste Building Council. That's for existing buildings, so that's being administered by GBCI now. So um, there's ways to tie it in um, to lead and they're tying it in for operations and management lead but would like to tie it into new buildings as well. Mm -hmm. And um, was it uh, always a cakewalk for you <laughs> or did you have any <laughs> challenges, did you come across any challenges? Um, there, were, there were many challenges along the way. I mean mm -hmm. the waste system is so kind of Byzantine in many ways that people have figured out ways to get around it and do it a certain way. And the idea of changing it, people are very reluctant to think that it could be done a better way. Mm. Um, Give us an example. Design to it. Um, like a building where the super does a really good job of, of having his shoot and his recycling, and but he has organics elsewhere. And we're like, well, many people don't use it because it's elsewhere. Could you ever put it in the same place? as you're recycling. And there's just a lot of resistance. People think organics is going to bring pests, um, even though that organic waste is part of the trash stream otherwise, and the bins 
cliff and they're rodent proof. And people are just, they don't want to do something different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and change what works for them, just, just works for them. Right. So, uh, I mean, um, it's, 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 they probably had been doing that for a while, for a few decades. So um, I think that kind of also. Yeah. Also, also, yeah. But we did see a lot of places, which was great that where, I mean, this was tied in with the biomimicry too, that where things kind of self organized and people made stuff work in their system and where the porters and the supers, their creativity was being used and valued, then these systems would work really mm. well. Mm. It wasn't kind of top down, but it was. But uh, uh, talk about biomimicry, don't you think um, the systems already organized themselves, um, mimicking nature elsewhere, even if there was no, you know, interventions? So, so w would we be saying that you're working to um, uh, implement better biomimicry or something which is sustainable uh, for, for the world? Um, I would say we could move them better. What we want to look to do is we are at that pioneer ecosystem level, I would say, where there's not a lot of reuse of, of materials. Um, so if we can help make those loops and Often, if you see what happens in an ecosystem, it's things like feedback. If you mm -hmm. start having more feedback, the system gets more circular and, and balances. And there's not a lot of feedback on waste. It's just like we throw it away and we don't think about it. We don't know how much there is. The whole way the system is set up, you don't get feedback, even in terms of fines or, or um, like, um, financial incentives for creating less waste yeah one of the case studies in the guidelines is actually etsy the the company the yeah. headquarters and they have an amazing feedback system so where you throw your waste away in their waste station um when the housekeeping comes and takes it she weighs it and they have a percentage they diverted the week before plastered right up there so when you're throwing something away you see well we diverted 89 percent of our waste last week mm -hmm. and they have a really well designed waste station but then they've also worked to limit the amount of disposable containers they have um, and engage employees they have a slack channel if you don't know where to throw something you can ask and find out immediately so they've instituted all these feedback systems that mean that they really that they're a certified zero waste facility Mm -hmm. which means they produce 90 percent of their waste uh, that's amazing and um uh, when we're talking about feedbacks i think uh the best feedback uh that we've gotten uh from um as a species for for our waste management is uh the plastic washing up on the beaches um yeah. but um uh, but if, if people want to um do something about um, waste in their buildings what would be the best um, examples out there? Uh, would it be Etsy, like you mentioned, or are there well, any other that's examples? A commercial example, and it's a great example of how to improve a commercial building. Um, residential buildings are, are a little different, but there is a lot you can do, and there's some case studies in the guidelines on what you can do in residential buildings, and some of it is kind of engagement, like engaging with the residents and education and then it's also collecting the additional streams like organics is almost a third of the waste stream if you can collect that and separate all of that organic waste that makes a huge difference mm -hmm. um, and also if you uh, currently the average is that we only collect 50 percent of our recycling streams the glass metal plastic cardboard i mean we need to get that up to 100 percent and then just education with people about how you can reduce the amount of waste you create in total as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we have um, about five minutes to go. Uh, do you have any uh, final remarks? Is there anything that you would like to share um, with the audience? Um, I would say that the other thing that's been great about the zero waste design guideline process and coming in from an architect's point of view and this point of view that design makes a change, although I mentioned the education there, really our push is that you shouldn't need to try so hard if we design the system better it shouldn't be 
so difficult to separate your waste. Like when you go to a, um, a restaurant and you bring your plates and disposable stuff and you try to see which thing to put where, it's often so confusing, badly designed. Or if you try and bring your own bag and you get pushed back, at the moment it's so difficult to do the right thing. And there's so much moralism about this is what you should be doing that it makes a lot of people dig in. And I think if coming from the point of view that if we could just design this better so it was the easiest thing to do, so people wanted to do it, then we'll get the kind of change. It has to be better, more beautiful, better designed, the easiest way for people to do things. Mm -hmm. um, I've um, worked on um, work with the UN headquarters here in uh, New York. Uh, we did a waste audit for them. And if uh, there was a visitor to um, uh, the headquarters or to any other building, uh, and if they wanted to find out where they could put a certain uh, packaging or certain um, waste material, the only way for them to under know that generally is to call the carting company. And sometimes even the carting company doesn't know whether this yeah. material should go into the right one. So it is kind of like, I understand how difficult it is. Um, and UN is right now, it's, it's trying to change that. And then they've put a lot of postage and um, a lot of work has gone into that. Um, could you talk um, about the zero waste guidelines with respect to um, low income housing? Um, yes, I mean, they're applicable to any type of housing. It's the same issues but we were very aware of like a if low-income housing has less um resources to spend on super time at the moment it's really tough because the code's written that you have to have these shoots and recycling collected on every story whereas i, I we came across buildings where the uh, supers want to close down the shoots because of pests because they can't keep up with the maintenance so i think we could change things to make it easier to those mm -hmm. buildings so maybe everybody would have to bring stuff to a central location um i mean the, all buildings are already spending a lot of effort and man hours dealing with the trash mm -hmm. i don't think the um the income level changes the the strategies much in fact mm -hmm. it's interesting the one time that dsmy did look at the different income levels and waste generation and how well people recycle the middle tier generate the less the least waste and do the best and upper and lower were kind of equivalent um, the upper were probably the worst mm -hmm. um, um, if someone wants to um, become part of what you're doing or help you or maybe get help from you um, which is the best way for them to um, get in touch with you well uh, on the zero waste design guidelines site there's a link to send emails it's feedback at zero waste design org and we check those emails but we are looking to maybe get a bit more active in social media and get things going. And uh, just as a last thought, the Center for Architecture is doing an exhibition this summer on the guidelines, free and open to the public. And I would encourage people in New York City to come along to that. Okay, okay, wonderful, great. Uh, with that, I think uh, we could end the interview here. Uh, thank, thank you so much. much. Yes, thank you, that was yeah. great. And I yeah. look forward to seeing your other web webinars. Wonderful, great. Thank you very much. Uh, friends, uh, thanks again. And uh, with this, we'll end the interview here. Uh, but we have um, other pioneers and change makers also um, joining us in the coming weeks. So please go to our events uh, page, um, sign up, and um, come, uh, you know, listen to them. And um, additionally, we're also continuing our knowledge partnerships with DISPA and uh, with Waste Aid UK. And you will see training uh, sessions um, happening in the next few months. And uh, stay um, subscribe uh, or follow us on social media so that uh, you understand uh, which event is coming when, so that you could uh, be a part of that. Uh, thank you again, and um, have a good day, good night, good evening.